talking about help the old woman down. Forty years ago, the HIV pandemic indeed brought global and, and local pain and suffering. It also exposed the horrors of injustice, bigotry, discrimination, stigma, and fear that had besieged marginalized persons for centuries. As that disease reached out to take the lives of millions, it also empowered the voices of millions more who refused to allow silence to equal death. Today, we come to celebrate those who refuse to be silent and who continue to speak through their work and our presence. This memorial is a tribute both to those who have died and to those whose lives continue to scream for the justice that only compassion can produce. It is a tribute to those who were lost and those who found themselves through kindness, through truth, and through courage. This memorial challenges us to honor love while continuing to work to save lives and uphold integrity. This memorial challenges us to never forget either the pains of injustice and loss or the joys of love and friendship. This here amp is a reminder that we have a responsibility to keep giving meaning and purpose to the lives of the millions lost to this disease and to the millions more living with it. We are here to activate and dedicate a memorial that is about more than remembering, for remembering is not the same as never forgetting. This here amp is about never forgetting that all persons deserve health and wholeness. All persons with a disease that just won't go away deserve to be fully loved, fully respected, and fully alive, even as they live with a disease that just won't go away. It's about never forgetting that we must continue to find the strength the energy and the will to carry one another through and over, not just this disease, but also we must find the strength, the energy and the will to carry one another past despair and fear. This here AMP stands as a call to action to continue to heal one another, continue to support one another, continue to stand with and if need be stand in place of one another as we struggle to bring goodwill and justice into our world. As we explore this incredible art, these incredible experiences, I urge all of us to let the beauty of these exhibits and these expressions sink deep into our souls so that we are inspired, so that we are emboldened to believe again in one another. My hope is that as we remember the past four decades of HIV and AIDS represented by this here amp, we will never forget that we are strong, that we are powerful. We will never forget that we are capable and compassionate, caring persons who can and will change this world. So as we emerge from yet another pandemic, let us renew our commitment to heal one another from the dazzling horror of this disease. Let us refuse to diminish the beauty of lives lost, refuse to diminish the power of love that remains at the very core of our being. We dedicate this memorial as a stepping off place for building communities of people steeped in hope, a stepping off place for building communities of people committed to a future of radical justice, a future of radical peace, a future of radical health, a future of radical love. This here AMP Memorial challenges us to truly love and live into one another as we remember Let us never, ever
forget. Please welcome for former Seattle Councilman and AMP Steering Committee member, Tom Rasmussen. Good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to be here today in this really beautiful, colorful setting for the A's Memorial Pathway. When we started looking for a place, we wanted a place that would be visible, accessible, and relevant to our committee, our community, and this is that place. The first person to contact me when I was on the city council about creating an A's Memorial was Rob Robley. And I don't know if Rob is here or not, but I think he's. Oh, there you are. How long ago was that? 2006? I think it's when I started out. And so, of course, what I did, I called someone else. I called Leonard Garfield of the Museum of History and Industry, and he thought it was a good idea. Then in 2015, during the budget, city council budget, the proposal came before the city council to uh, fund some planning for an AIDS memorial. And uh, two people came to testify before the council at one of our budget hearings, Michelle Hassan and Paul Feldman. Paul got us off to a really good, strong start. And Rob and Michelle and Leonard, you've been wonderful in your tireless work for these last five and a half years. Thank you. Folks, you can't imagine the work that Michelle and uh, Rob have done to really get us here where we are today and what Paul did. And then of course, Jason Floyd, who's our project manager. When Seattle provided the first funds, we were asked to do three things. Create a place of reflection and remembrance, and this is that place. Tell the stories of HIV AIDS in our community, and call people to action to fight AIDS and stigma and discrimination against people living with HIV AIDS. When Sound Transit began planning this site, the community was promised that it would reflect the history of this neighborhood, and that promise has been kept. I'm proud to report to you that we have met the city's requirements. If it were not for the city of Seattle, Sound Transit and Girding Eadland, the developer of this site, the generous and supportive developer of this site, we would not be here today. This neighborhood has been central to the LGBTQ community for decades. It even has its own newspaper, the Seattle Gay News. And you know, it's been just a year since George Bacon died, the owner and editor for the SGN for many, many years, 30, maybe 40 years. The SGN now is, has a tent over there. So let's just think about George and all that he contributed to our community. There's Maggie, Maggie Bloodstone from the Seattle Gay News. She's got extra copies that remember George, who passed away just uh, a year ago. This is our place of reflection and remembrance. This mor memorial cannot be ignored and we wanted it to be prominent and accessible, and it is. We want people to know that while infection, infection can be prevented, there's still no vaccine, and there's still no cure once a person is infected with HIV. We want people to know that in Seattle and King County alone, over 3,000 mostly young men, many from this neighborhood, died of AIDS before life-sustaining treatments began in 1996. People their names and their stories are central to all that we're trying to do. We have met many people to seek support for the AIDS Memorial Pathway. Sometimes they tell us of their experience with HIV AIDS. King County Council Mayor Larry Gossett met with us and he told us about his youngest brother, Patrick. After his military service, Patrick stayed in Colorado. One day, two of his friends visited the Gossett family in Seattle and they said, your brother is very ill. The family wanted Patrick to come home so they could care for him. Patrick refused, probably because of the stigma of being gay and having HIV AIDS. But their stepdad, who would not be discouraged, went to Colorado, loaded Patrick in a U-Haul, and brought him home. The family cared for Patrick until he went into Bailey Boucher house. Shortly before he died, Patrick told them that he couldn't have a better family. Patrick was finally at peace with himself. He knew that his family loved him. The story of Patrick and the Gossett family is precious. It's just one of many interviews that Rosette Royale has conducted. Stories and writings are on our website. Go to our website and now go to our app. You will be inspired. 
When talking to gay men of my generation about those early days, it's not unusual for someone to say, I lost all my friends. I too have felt that despair, and it's profound. This is Pride Month, and you can be proud of how we came together in the 1980s to support those with HIV AIDS, and we do so today. You can be proud that all of Seattle's mayors and city councils, all of them, have supported HIV AIDS services and care from the beginning. You can be proud that we have representatives and senators providing leadership to protect the civil rights of people with HIV AIDS and to fund housing and to fund care. There are over 34 million people now living in the world with HIV AIDS. Gay men and people of color in this community are most at risk. History is repeating itself. COVID is today's pandemic, disproportionately affecting people of color, just as HIV AIDS is today. If we pull back our response to HIV AIDS because of COVID, more people will become infected. There's immense wealth and talent in this community. In the spirit of ACT UP, and these signs were inspired by ACT UP, these words are from ACT UP protest. In the spirit of ACT UP, we must demand more funding for public health and demand that more be done to overcome the institutional barriers and biases in healthcare, housing, and education towards minority communities. Today, we dedicate the AIDS Memorial in memory of all those who have passed away. We honor those who cared for and comforted people with AIDS, especially in the early days when there was so little hope and so much fear, and in honor of those who are caring for people today. We really appreciate your support. We couldn't have done it without you. Thank you for joining us. Childers. I'm the acting director at the City of Seattle at the Office of Arts and Culture, and I am so pleased to be here. Thank you all so much for being here today. This is an extraordinary day. Thank you for weathering the, the weather uh, to, to be here to, to celebrate these amazing works of art that we are adding to the city's collection. This project has been years in the making, and it is a testament to this community that we have gotten this far after so many years. Public art is a powerful tool because it allows us to tell our stories, to celebrate our community, and to capture the spirits of our humanity in public where it's accessible to everybody. The artworks we're dedicating today by Horatio Law, Chris Paul Jordan, Stormy Weather, and the Civilization Studio take, a, take visitors on an emotional and resonant journey through the AIDS and HIV epidemic. These artworks demonstrate our values and commitment to those who have been and continue to be marginalized within our communities. They provide a physical reminder of the devastating impact of HIV and AIDS, the stigma and discrimination that many faced and still encounter today. These works are an expression of our grief, but also stand as a testament to our humanity and resiliency. I'm so proud that these works will be coming into the city's collection and will be maintained for future generations. I'd like to read a few lines from the city's proclamation. By 1996, when effective treatment for HIV and AIDS first became available, 5,111 King County residents had been diagnosed with AIDS, and 3,273 were dead from HIV. And while AIDS affects all communities, AIDS has disproportionately affected gay men, transgender communities, people of color, particularly black and brown communities, and refugee and immigrant communities. In 2017, by resolution 317873, Seattle expressed its support for the AIDS Legacy Memorial, now known as the AMP, and community members and organizations formed the AIDS Memorial Pathway to create a place of reflection and remembrance and to ensure this history and the many stories of the AIDS HIV epidemic in Seattle and our state are told. While today there's still no vaccine or cure, which underscores the importance of a visible and permanent reminder of HIV and AIDS, today we are here to honor those who we have lost and pay tribute through this memorial. There are so many people to thank 
for making this happen. I'd like to extend, extend a special thank you to the public art project management team of Kristen Ramirez, Maya McKnight, and Becky Johnson, the Girding Ebling and Sound Transit teams for working on an incredibly complicated agreement to make sure that this could happen on this particular space. I also want to recognize the master plan artist Horatio Law, uh, who conceptualized this pathway, artist Chris Paul Jordan, Stormy Weather, Stormy Weber, excuse me, and the Civilization Studio for creating the inspiration and pub <clears throat> for creating this inspiration, and the Public Art Advisory Committee for who helped steward the project. Tom Rasmussen, Paul Feldman, Jason Plorn, and Michelle Hassan have provided exemplary leadership throughout the years. And of course, Mayor Jenny Durkin, whose stewardship of this project brought us across the finish line. Thank you all so much. And now from our state capitol, please welcome Senator Jamie Peterson. Good afternoon, everyone. You were welcomed this morning by the music of Seattle Men's Chorus singing Sonia de Volare. And I know that my uh, brothers in the chorus would have been very happy to be here in person, but I was actually reflecting how appropriate it was that our music was here in sort of ethereal form, given the numbers of people that we've lost. I joined the chorus in January 1996, just over 20 years ago, and our weekly newsletter that came out, The Music Man, it was called, had unfortunately just about every week the story of someone who had died in the chorus. At our holiday shows, for years before I joined and for years after, you may remember a long row of red poinsettias at the front of the stage, one for each of the chorus members who had died of AIDS. It was that year, 1996, when the first drug cocktail became available and really started to turn the corner for people. And I want you to reflect on that for just a moment. 15 years, 15 years before there was any treatment. Many of which years had no acknowledgement from the President of the United States or other officials in the government that there was even a pandemic. I appreciate the echoes in the current pandemic, which happily we're about to come out of, but we cannot forget, we cannot forget and we can never accept how unresponsive our government was to an entire group of its citizens who were dying. This memorial is gonna help us not forget for the kids, for my kids, for all the future kids that stream out of the light rail station, that come by this place, it is going to be a conversation starter. It's going to be an opportunity for learning and growth. Because you know what? 40 years on, we are still living with inequity in whom this disease affects. We are still living with legacy discrimination against gay men who cannot give blood, who cannot donate sperm. 40 years on. I showed my kids this morning a picture of the, uh, of the art over there. And they were asking, why an X? And I said, well, I think it's a plus sign that's turned on its side, tipped over. Uh, they said, oh, yeah, like HIV positive? And I said, yeah. And one of them said, well, the great thing when you tip over a plus sign is it can't be put back up. It's there for good. And I love that metaphor. 
we have made huge progress here. But we are going to have to continue to work together and be reminded of what we do, what we need to do to wrestle this disease to the ground and make sure that it is only a lesson from history. I was very pleased to, as the current steward of Cal Anderson's seat in the State Senate, uh, to help get some money to uh, make this project a reality. And on behalf of the entire people of the state of Washington, I'm pleased that we will have forever this place to remember that pandemic and how it shaped and continues to shape all of us. Thank you very much. Happy Pride, everyone. <laughs> Hello, my name is Russell Campbell. I am an AMSEARN committee member and deputy director of the Office of HIV AIDS Network Coordination based at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. I have the pleasure of introducing Christopher Paul Jordan, the creator of the centerpiece sculpture titled, And I'm Gonna Miss Everybody. I had the delight of chatting with Christopher right before coming on stage and learning a little bit more about what went into his creation. Christopher's paintings and sculptures are time capsules from his work in community, and his artwork for the AMP serves this function while also incorporating complex themes and layers of meaning. He has been recognized by the Nettie Artist Award in Painting, the James W. Ray Venture Project Award, the John Ember Fellowship, and the Artist Trust Fellowship. It is an honor to welcome Christopher Paul Jordan. This piece uh, started with a, a few big questions. Um, and one of those questions for me was, you know, how do we mourn and how do we grieve the lives of people, so many of which are still unnamed because of the stigma, because of the racism, because of the homophobia. And um, I encountered during the process of making this piece, the words of a, of a HIV and AIDS activist, Krishna Stone, who spoke about how day after day, there was so many deaths and one day after the next, and we've kind of re-experienced that over the past year in ways we, we never expected to. But um, it got to the point where she couldn't go to every memorial service. She couldn't go to every single, um, she couldn't go to every ceremony. And she would go to the club. And she would ask this question. She would say, who am I, who am I dancing for tonight? We have a lot of people to dance for. We have a lot of loved ones, oh, God, that, are still dying because of this disease. And we've seen with COVID in real time how the same parallels, how, how just, you know, like last, it, I think it was around April of last year when the government started to say, oh, well, these people are dying because they have diabetes or they're dying because of, you know, their, their, connected, um, their connected issues. They're, the government just being right back there in the same place to deny the existence of a disease. Just, it just shows us that we're still here at square one, at square zero. And um, I, guess, I guess what I wanna say with this piece is just that we, we can't give up. We have to keep coming back, we have to keep dancing, we have to keep celebrating, we have to keep remembering. And we have to 
live every day just knowing that that it's, that it's through our lives and through our actions that we do honor and justice to those who have passed on. So I hear the call to action from them. You know, this place is in particularly important because not only is it, you know, important space in terms of LGBTQ history in Seattle, but it's also an epicenter of a housing crisis that is sweeping people away and, put, and taking them out of this community. There's a study called A Synergism of Plagues that transformed the history of epidemiology um, that talked about how the Bronx became an epicenter for AIDS in New York because of planned shrinkage and demolition of housing, what they called contagious housing destruction. And so I wanted this piece to be a place, I asked this question like, what would it be like to have a space that made you know like, this is for you, a, a space worthy of coming back home to, um, a space where we can come and commune and connect with our loved ones who are on the other side, um, and a space where we can have impromptu raves <laughs> and dance parties and, and come out in vogue and come out and, and just and celebrate and reclaim space. So uh, Gertie England, I hope y'all are ready. <laughs> I hope y'all are ready for some dance parties. Um, I hope your neighbors are ready for some loud music. Because when you think about that loved one that you know, that person that you remember, and what they would ask of you, and what they would call for you, they would expect you to keep living. They would expect you to refuse to be erased. They would expect you to dance and live and, and, and live out their legacy. And so we're here today to refuse that erasure. We're here today to refuse gentrification and displacement. We're here to refuse racism and homophobia and transphobia and ableism. We're here to demolish all of that. That's what this, that's what this space is for and that's what it's about. So um, we don't know exactly what. <laughs> <laughs> Act up. So get ready to party. <laughs> and um, I, I want to thank, uh, there's, there's a numerous people to thank, but uh, really in this moment, I just, I want to thank Rosette. Yeah. Rosette Royale, you, you started this process creatively for us in a way that by allowing people here with us in this moment to, 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 to release the grief and to tell the stories that they hadn't been able to tell and having you approach them with compassion to open up that space to feel and to love and to remember and embody those people. You have done our whole community a huge, unquantifiable um, service and gift. So I just wanna thank you for your commitment and the compassion and the love that you brought to make this possible because you set me on my path. You, you were the first person I spoke to and you've guided me on my way of what this needs to be. So thank you, Rosetta. And yeah, I guess it's just, we're gonna have to fuck it up. <laughs> we're gonna have to party, y'all, so thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, happy Pride, and it's a beautiful day here in Seattle. Um, my name is Jeff Sakuma, and I am a uh, steering committee member for the AMP, and I also am the house strategist here at the City of Seattle. And I'd like to thank our city council members who are here with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so I'm going to read the rest of this because I'm going to be introducing civilization. And what they do, I know, I experience it every day, but I have no idea what it means. So here we go. Uh, so um, I'm here to introduce uh, the design team, uh, Civilization. Oh, this is hard to read in this light. 
Uh, their artworks uh, were already here, which you can see are the beautiful signs around here, are located on opposite sides of the, the plaza and just across the Barbara Bailey Way uh, on, into, Cal into Cal Anderson Park. Civilization was founded uh, by Corey Gutch, Gabriel Stromberg, and Michael Ellsworth. Uh, since the studio's inception, it has built identity systems, digital experiences, and environmental graphics that are engaging, empathetic, um, and create meaningful uh, connections. Civilization has received numerous design and web awards, and I should note that Civilization also created the AMPS website, uh, which contains a wealth of information and personal videos that uh, have already been spoken about. So, with that, please welcome Civilization. Hi, <laughs> uh, I'm Corey, this is Michael and Gabriel. Um, when we first began this project, we had to decide you know, what was our subject gonna be, and that was a, a really big challenge. Um, what were we gonna re memorialize through public artworks? Because um, within the history of AIDS and HIV, there are so many perspectives and so many different experiences and so many stories and contributions that are really significant and um, important and meaningful. Um, and ultimately, we chose to celebrate the collective action that has been so foundational in the fight against AIDS and HIV. The protests, demonstrations, the campaigns and marches, these are moments of public convergence that brought people together and they created awareness and transformed our community and our cultural consciousness. The public gatherings not only created social impact but also generated connection and advocacy within the LGBTQ community. Being part of this project has been such an honor for us, and it's been such a wonderful experience collaborating with a team of people who are so personally invested in this work. Jason, Rebecca, Michelle, Tom, Jeff, the entire community action group, thank you for your dedication, and thanks for all the guidance that you gave us throughout our creative process. I'd also like to thank the individuals who took the time to share with us their personal experiences, their knowledge. When we were in our research phase of this project, Ann McGettigan, uh, Dr. Bob Wood, Tim Burak, Ro Yoon, Rosette Royale, Fred uh, Swanson at uh, the um, uh, Gay City, hearing your perspectives, uh, you sharing with us your stories was transformative and it truly shaped how we approached the project. I'd also like to thank the architects and developers whose expertise was so valuable in envisioning how these artworks could be integrated within the built environment. Uh, Grace Kim and Mira Mui at Skamata, uh, uh, Jill Sherman at Gerding Eadland. Uh, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and with your resources. To continue the thank you train, thank uh, Jay Schatz, at Green Tech, and a very big thank you to the people who helped us fabricate the signs, Scott Davis of Davis Signs and Michael Evans, really helped bring this vision to life. And I want to thank our team at Civilization, Gabriel and Corey, just worked so hard and gave so much to this project, and thank you guys for doing such a fantastic job. And we're so grateful to be a part of this project and to be included in this lineup of visionary and inspiring artists such as Christopher, Horatio, and Stormy. It's a true honor, and thank you all for coming out today. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name's Marlis Erickson, and I'm a member of the AMP Steering Committee, and I'm also the AMP Fundraising Chair. And it's my great pleasure today to have the job of introducing you to Stormy Weber. 
her piece, In This Way We Loved One Another, is located in that turquoise building over there in the community room, the Kathy Hillenbrand community room. And it was the first piece completed by the AMP and dedicated last December on World AIDS Day. So, Stormy. She's a poet and an interdisciplinary artist. Her work is cross-genre. She's incorporated text, performance, archival photographs, and interviews, all to try to engage with ideas of history, lineage, gender, race, and sexuality. Stormy's been recognized in a lot of places, including Hedgebrook, Ragdale, the Banff Art Center, and she was honored with the James W. Ray Award. Please welcome Stormy Weber. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, and, and thank you, first of all, as always, to the ancestors who made the way for this to happen. Um, I would like to uh, call in um, the spirit of a friend of mine, if I can make the thing work. Uh, hang on. Oh, it's always like this. Um, Essex Hemphill, who was a friend of mine. And, and uh, I, I met him when I lived in London, and he came to do some readings in London. And we went together to the first queer arts festival in, I believe it was Cambridge. And he was reading Christo's poem called The Giveaway Poem. And I, I advise you to read that poem. It was my first time here, and it was so beautiful. And he said, can you sing something with me? So I sang, if this world were mine, I would place at your feet all that I own. You've been so good to me. If this world were mine. And I, I sure remember that. I want to read this poem that is called when my brother fell, it's for Joseph Bean. When my brother fell, I picked up his weapons and never once questioned whether I could carry the weight and the grief. The responsibility he shouldered, I never questioned whether I could aim or be as precise as he. He had fallen and the passing ceremonies marking his death did not stop the war. Standing at the front lines, flanked by able brothers who miss his eloquent courage, his insistent voice, urging us to rebel, urging us to not fear embracing for more than sex, for more than kisses and notches in our belts. Our loss is greater than all the space we fill with prayers and praise. He burned out his pure life force to bring us a chance to love ourselves with commitment. He knew the simple spilling of seed would not be enough to bind us. It is difficult to stop marching, Joseph, impossible to stop our assault. The tributes and testimonies in your honor flare up like torches. Every night a light blazes for you in one of our hearts. There was no one lonelier than you, Joseph. Perhaps you wanted love so desperately and pleaded with God for the only mercy that could be spared. Perhaps God knew you couldn't be given more than public love in this lifetime. When I stand on the front lines now, cussing the lack of truth, the absence of willful change and strategic coalitions, I realize sewing quilts will not bring you back or save us. It's too soon to make monuments for all we are losing for the lack of truth as to why we are dying. Who wants us dead? What purpose does it serve? When my brother fell, I picked up his weapons. I didn't question whether I could aim or be as precise as he. And needle and thread were not among his things I found. Long live Essex Hemphill. Thank you so much. And uh, I would just like to say just briefly, I would like to give my profound thanks to the ancestors who have made this space. Uh, I, I stand here as a person who walks in Seattle's queer history. I was born in 1959 to an Alaskan native lesbian mother who had come out in the mid-50s. 
I grew up in Pioneer Square quite often in the casino, the Busy Bee, uh, the double header. I create work that restores missing narratives of Seattle's history. My dear friend Patrick Haggerty of Lavender Country, who was my mother's friend and I've known since a teenager, he called me a gutter snipe, so I guess I'm the gutter snipe historian of Seattle. So I'm happy to, to bring the beloveds who were the farthest from help, the farthest from help. And in this past year, we all experienced what it's like to have a government that doesn't care if you live or die. Some of us more than others. The death toll from COVID is, is higher in black and brown communities. We're experiencing the same things. So as, this, as our world transforms, my prayer for this, this installation, that it continues to grow, that it continues to be a place for activation, for understanding our history, um, for continuing to resist and to really build a beloved community, where as Patrick Haggerty said, if you can't see yourself in these photographs, look again. Yes, okay, so I'd like to not take a lot of time um, and I wanted to read one more poem from another beautiful brother that we did lose. His name was Roy Gonzalez. And speaking of the way that the beautiful words that my brother Chris said, that they want us to live, I have his poetry book where he said, Stormy, keep living, singing, being. And Roy, I'm doing my best. This poem is called Remembrance. Let us think of all those that we love. Let us continue to struggle against a system that doesn't allow us all life. We're together or we're, we're fallen. We must stand together at this time. This is Roy Gonzalez's poem, Remembrance. When my voice does not speak and the tears no longer fall, sew my spirit into a quilt, add silks for the woman I used to be, rhinestones for my arrogance, but whatever you do, so one of my poems with red thread and remember me. I thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I like the way we're all moving back towards the, uh, the shade we needed today. I'm Leonard Garfield. I'm a proud member of the AMP Steering Committee, and I'm also the Executive Director of MOHAI. And it's my great pleasure and honor today to introduce Horatio Hunyan Law. Horatio was first selected to create the AMP Master Art Plan, which is really the guiding framework which has set the vision and laid the groundwork for this entire memorial. Horatio's own beautiful artwork, Ribbon of Light, will include three sculptures which will soon be installed along the landscape pathway uh, just adjacent here in Cal Anderson Park. Horatio was born in Hong Kong, he was educated in New York, and his diverse background has continued to influence his artistic practice. His public artwork can be seen around the Northwest, and Horatio often tackles weighty subjects in unexpected ways, creating quiet, sometimes conflicting, sometimes meditative, but always evocative artwork. Please join me in welcoming Horatio Hunyan Law. Enrage, courage, engage. These are some of the words that are engraved and hidden inside the three stations of glass sculptures that are under the collective title of Ribbon of Light. Losing, releasing, forgiving. Because of the frosted surface of the sculpture, these words may appear or disappear depending on the weather and the lighting condition. Be read, be loved, belong. These words I call murmurs are meant to tease out some of the many different emotions connected with our experience of the AIDS pandemic. Some of us 
might have buried these feelings deep inside, or we might have put them aside simply because we have to continue to live. But we carry them with us. Always. Whether we know it or not, these murmurs of love, loss, rage, guilt, joy, and sadness, whether they're visible or hidden, they make us who we are. They make me who I am. My own experience of living through the AIDS pandemic in New York City in the 1980s compelled me to find creative way to express and channel these emotions. And now 40 years later, I am a public artist who works with community to express who they are through creative artwork. Ribbon of Light will be installed in Cal Anderson Park over there later this summer. It represents the AIDS pandemic as a meteoric and shattering event, as if a piece of the sky has fallen to the ground and broken into large and small sculptural fragments. When you visit Cal Anderson Park later this summer, maybe you can discover your own murmurs while you walk among the sculptures. All public art projects are collaborations between the artists and the community they serve. This artwork is a direct result of working and talking with all of you in the community, too many to mention. But I want to especially thank everyone on the Community Action Committee for the valuable knowledge and advice, Tim Burak for his passion and knowledge on the history of the pandemic and response of the LGBTQ community in Seattle. Mark Adrian for his advocacy on behalf of the disability community in shaping this artwork. Keith Bacon for his expertise with word and helping me to craft out the text of the murmurs. Kelly Go for his guidance with Seattle Parks and Recreation. Ruri Yampowski for her inspiration. Paul Feldman, Kristen Ramirez, Jason Floyd, and Maya McKnight for the expert guidance and management of this project. Linda Laresh and Michael Venkoff for their generous hospitality of opening their home to me during the last few years of working on this project. Most of all, I am especially grateful for the opportunity to be a part of the AIDS Memorial Pathway Project at this point of my artistic life. Thank you. Please welcome the chair of the AMP Steering Committee, Michelle Hassan. talking about memories all morning. Um, and, and here's my memory. Tom calls Leonard. Leonard calls me. I call Marlis. And then we begin. It's just like that. I am filled with amazement and wonder that these more than 8,000 souls from Washington State who perished during our AIDS pandemic aren't with us anymore. So we have set out to remember them and to create a new memory. I'd like to thank you all for being with us today. Um, you'll remember today because it's so hot. Over five and a half years have brought us to this point with the all volunteer members of the Community Action Group, the Steering Committee, and our stalwart staff. Karen Flink kept our, us on budget and on time. 
Rosette Royale gathered the stories you'll see on our website. And without the superb leadership of Jason Plord, our project manager, we, we wouldn't be greeting you today. And Michael Ingersoll, empresario of the First Order, in assembling us today. We've created some remarkable partnerships with other AIDS memorials, and I'd like to recognize John Cunningham, who's um, from the National AIDS Memorial in San Francisco, who's here today, and where are you, John? Yay, thank you, thank you for joining us. Our first partner, and probably most significant, is the City of Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture. Our first meeting with Randy Engstrom gave us the courage to move forward and the unflagging support of the Seattle Parks Foundation and Thatcher Bailey set us on the right path. All of the artworks will be part of the city's art collection and will be maintained in perpetuity by them. We've listened to the community's comments on the content of our website theamp.org, and please check it out, and you can add in your own stories. Novabi is our partner in creating the app that you'll learn about over here today, and I think you'll be uh, surprised by some of the interactive features that have been developed. There are over 550 donors to this project, which includes really all of you here. How do you appropriately thank the state of Washington for culture and the city of Seattle who said yes with many supportive council members and departments and Carl and Renee Banky right there my dear Ellen Ferguson who is here someplace there she is right there and and Kathy Gerlich who I don't think she's here who have been with us on so many important projects in this city, they said yes almost before they were asked. To all of our donors, I hope that this project reflects your hopes for all of us. The community group wanted to ensure that the stories, information, and resources will be maintained into the future. We're pleased to announce that we have confirmed an agreement with the nonprofit Gay City that will take on stewardship of the AMP in September when all of the elements are complete. So here to say a few words are Fred Swanson and Melvin Gibbons from, from Gay City, Seattle's LGBTQ Center. From me personally, thank you so much for the memory of today it will live in our hearts for a very long time. So we're filled with joy to be part of this glorious celebration. Uh, Pride is definitely rooted in the celebration of who we are, uh, in remembrance of those who came before us and carrying on that fight for liberation. And the work at the AMP is no different. Gay City is very honored to, to carry on the work launched by the committee. This passion project definitely dates back to the origins of our agency, Gay City Seattle's LGBTQ Center. So back in 1995 when Gay City got started, um, our original tagline was building a community stronger than HIV. and uh, right after we got started is when combination therapy hit a year later. And so Gay City has really been part of the journey of how do we live as a community, how do we live with HIV, and how do we live beyond those days, those original days of, of HIV in Seattle. So really thrilled to be a part of this um, and to carry on that legacy um, and also to talk a little bit about what we do nowadays. So, I know we, we started with the, oh, geez. 
It's a lot of activity going on there. Uh, we definitely started with the, with the mission of creating a community that was stronger than HIV and AIDS. And we, today we've seen our agency grow, uh, seeing that the needs of our community have grown and we've added on additional needs for our community since then. And so now today, Gay City offers uh, nearly a dozen different services for our community, a majority of them free at or low cost, just to make sure that we can create, we can break down those barriers to create space for our community uh, to survive and thrive, even, even today and in the future. So we are at the end of the year getting ready to open our uh, third version of Seattle's LGBTQ Center. So stay tuned um, and you'll see we'll be opening a new space at the end of the year, a new center for the community. And in closing, I, uh, I wanted to just read when I'm not a, a gay for a living, which is most of the time, uh, or a father, uh, I'm also a writer and a poet. And so I wanted to read really quickly something that I wrote that I thought was uh, related to this idea that we would be carrying on this legacy. Uh, it's a poem called Conversations on Instagram that was published as part of the HIV Here and Now Poem a Day Project for National Poetry Month last year, and then republished this month in uh, Snapdragon, a journal of art and healing. We had a class on that, he says, a response to my suggestion that he read David Feinberg, maybe they learn the term AIDS clone. Personal narratives are more powerful than history books, I say, maybe hoping he'd ask me about my story, maybe hoping he'd read other stories. Bill Bridges, Among the Dead, The Survivors, and Those Who Came Later. I consider myself a survivor. I consider myself a witness. Even when looking was too hard to register, or the world refused to see us, living, loving, caring, dying, even though HIV still runs through my veins. I want him to know of a time when queer women and dykes and lesbians seemed to be the only ones who could see. Maternal hands when our own mothers rejected us, holding us, wiping our tears, cleaning up our filth. They cared for us when no one else would, I tell him. We owe them so much. I want him to know of a time when fags and queens and gay men and fairies took to the streets, demanding to be seen and heard and valued and acknowledged, demanding humanity and decency. We were so powerful, I tell him. Queer warriors fighting for one another. I pause. I think I saw an article on that, he, sa he says. I pause, and the moment is gone. The commitment that Gay City has to continuing this legacy and to honoring the stories is, is real. And we're really honored to be a part of this and to ask you to also help us continue to tell these stories and be a part of the work that's happened here today and that has gotten us to this point. So thank you very much. Good morning, I'm Michael Ingersoll, a CAG committee member and general rabble rouser. So today we're not here to cut a red ribbon like in other ceremonies. We're here to tie a ribbon to bring people together. During the AIDS pandemic, many language was, languages were spoken, the language of hope, the language of pain, the language of loss and sorrow, the language of anger, the language of inspiration, the language of compassion and love, and more. There was a language, though, that was a recognizable thread among us a voiceless connection we shared, where words were not enough, but where recognition and compassion and a deeper knowing was expressed. And this was the language of the red ribbon. Whenever we saw a person wearing one, we had kinship with them immediately, where the way we looked at each other was the language of connection. So today I'd like to celebrate and honor that small gesture that was so important. Today we will tie the red ribbon together. 
Volunteers will be bringing the separate legs to join with the loop, bringing it and us together today. And once the ribbon is whole, I, and at the, as our, our program ends, I'd like to invite you to come down and write your own personal message and prayer or remembrance or whatever you feel moved to share that will become a part of this important ribbon. Thank you for participating in that action. Okay, the ribbon is united. My name is Jason Floyd. I'm the uh, project manager for the AIDS Memorial Pathway, and uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to be able to work with so many of you and make this project a reality. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many of you here today. It's one, even more wonderful to think about the thousands of people who are going to see these artworks and engage with them to remember, to learn, and to be inspired. Um, so we're closing out the program now. I want to remind you of a few things. One is to sign this ribbon. The pieces of this ribbon are going to be used to make a, a panel for the National AIDS Memorial Quilt, which uh, we've been talking with John about. So there will be an AMP panel um, as part of the National Memorial Quilt. So please come up throughout the day, invite your friends that come by between noon and three to sign their name, name of a loved one, a message they might have, whatever you want to say to be a part of this momentous occasion. Um, uh, I invite you to stop by that tent and talk to the folks at Novabuy who are doing the AR app so you can uh, download the app and see how that um, uh, uh, component is going to work and uh, learn more about what they're doing and there will be more released throughout the summer. Um, you can tour the community room, as mentioned. It's down the end of Nagel Place here, right at the corner of East John Street. Um, you can go through the room, which is a rare opportunity because it's not a room that's generally open to the public. So you'll get to go through that room, talk to Stormy about the artwork that's in there. Um, and we do ask that you wear a mask while you're in that room, and it's one direction. So you'll go inside the, the entrance off of 10th Avenue, and you'll come out in the, the door of the alley here. Um, and then, of course, go through the park. Uh, right on the northeast corner of the park is Horatio's, uh, where Horatio's artwork will be installed later this summer, but you can walk the pathway, you can talk to Horatio there. You can also go to see the temporary artwork, which is around the um, pump house, the gatehouse, uh, right next, uh, uh, just beyond the fountain here, uh, Claire Johnson, and there's cards, uh, informational cards at each of the tables that'll explain more about that artwork. Um, and I want to take a quick thanks to all the temporary artists. Not only these four artists uh, uh, were engaged and worked with the AMP, but we worked with a lot of temporary artists to do um, uh, installations over the last few years um, to, get, you know, to connect with more communities and to show all about uh, what the AIDS, uh, the AIDS Memorial Pathway is about. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much for coming on this hot day. And uh, thank you for supporting the AMP, the AIDS Memorial Pathway.